Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Hello again and welcome inside the MTOM Show studios. I'm Paul Yeager. This is part two of a discussion with Jen Loeb. Now, Jen and I grew up in Jessup, Iowa together. Both went to Wartburg College in Waverly, Iowa, but Jen took a different career path, one that has led her around the world. In previous episode, in the previous episode, episode one, we talk about kind of how she got into climbing, how it was a reunion with some college classmates. We're going to pick up today about climbing Mount Everest, how long it takes, how much it is to do, and just how physically, emotionally, mentally it is on the body to make that climb, how long of a day it is, and just how taking one step is such a challenge. So here is part two of our interview with Jen Lowe. All summer long in, in 2013, I'm hashing this over and um, turning it over in my mind and looking at it from every angle. And I remember one morning I got up and, you know, it was, that's the first thing it was always in my mind. And that's the first thing as I'm getting up that morning, I'm kind of hashing it over again and again. And I had got up that morning and I'm just like, make up your mind, Jen. Like I'm having this internal dialogue and I'm like, Jen, make up your mind. You've looked at it from every angle. There's nothing left to consider. Like, you know, um, like you, there's no stone you haven't un unturned. Like, it's a yes or no question, make up your mind. And I decided to go for it because um, I knew that if I didn't, I would always regret it. And I would always kick myself for not even trying. And I would always wonder if I could have made it. And, and I, it's like, well, I don't know, Jen, you didn't even try. And I knew that I would just endlessly you know, kick myself and regret the fact that I hadn't tried. So at that point, I decided to sign up for Everest. Like I was going to do it. I don't know when, but I was going to try and, and get it in. Well, okay. Then, before, before you just make the final decision, you mentioned some of the discussions and the debates that you were having. And, and it sounds like you've checked off a minute. I want to go back to the financial side, because this is not a, hey, anybody wants to do it can do it free. There's a fee and it's like a permit, right? That yes. you have to have. And do you have to have, is it like a resume where it says, I've climbed yes. this, I've climbed this, I've climbed this. It's like a punch card system before you mm -hmm. can go up. So you have to show that you're serious. So in your mind, you've checked off all these boxes of, well, they're going to ask me this, this, and this, and I can answer yes, yes, yes. So financially, then you have to decide, like you mentioned, you're juggling uh, a life and work and to be able to afford it. So you've got to get creative a little bit in, it's not just about the physical and the mental side. There's this financial thing too, that you're trying to work. Yeah. Through. And it's, it's pretty pricey to go. And that was one of the things I really had to consider, um, you know, prior to, to signing up for this. And, um, <laughs> You know, it was it was a difficult decision to make because it is so expensive and I don't I'm not a wealthy person. I don't have that kind of cash. And so when I made the decision um, to go for it, I was going to, you know, ask around and see if I could get sponsored. And so I started, you know, hitting the pavement and, and going around and asking businesses if it, like, hey, I'm a climber. I'm, this is what I'm doing and I'm going to go try and do Everest. Are you interested in being part of this? And, and people would be like, oh yeah, no, like, <laughs> you know, nobody was willing to take a chance on me. And I think, um, I think people just thought I was a scammer. Like nobody was believing me that yeah, you're going to go climb Everest, you know, give me some money. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, right. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody had heard from me. I kind of flew under the radar. And so when you just walk into a business and tell people you're going to go climb Everest, would you, you know, hand over some cash? And no, that's not happening. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, 
nobody sponsored me. Uh, and so I was trying to get creative as far as um, some fundraisers. I had a, a dinner and a silent auction. I was selling t-shirts and beanies and um, people had asked me to, to set up a GoFundMe. I was reluctant to do that because for me, it's always really awkward to ask people for money and but people are like, Jen, set one up. And so uh, I, I set up a GoFundMe and people were donating to that. And, um, but more often than not, people were just like slipping me a couple of bucks in, in the hallway. <laughs> you know, I'm at work and they're just like, Jen, here, put this towards your Everest expedition. And so, you know, it's so expensive. Like I was squirreling away as much money as I could. And, um, and actually, in the end, I ended up uh, taking out a loan <laughs> to pay for it. And, and I've had people give me grief about this, um, but about the financial part of it. And because it's so pricey and, and, you know, you can spend all this money and then, you know, then just go up there and die. And people are like, oh, you're going to spend all this money and go get yourself killed. And so there was a lot of criticism and, and, Every day, people were like, Jen, you're crazy. Jen, you're crazy. Jen, you're crazy. That was actually going to be one of my friend raisers. I was going to tell people they had to pay me a dollar for every time they told me they were crazy. But it didn't work because they would just tell me that I was crazy and then walk away. And then they wouldn't even pay me a dollar. So, <laughs> so that didn't even work. But um, Couldn't even cash in on your own insanity. Do you want to tell us how much it is uh, to climb? <laughs> What's the price? What's that? What's the price tag to climb? It's sixty five thousand. And that covers the permit and what? That covers so there's money going everywhere. So that covers the permit, which is really pricey just in it of itself. And then you have um, you know, there's an army of people there doing all kinds of different jobs. You have cooks, you have cook boys, you have assistant guides, guides, um, porters, you have uh, people you know, there's there's money going in, in lots of different directions. And so you, they just lump it all together into a lump sum and then they get the cash and then they distribute it to the, all the different people that are doing all the different jobs. And so, you know, when it came to um, looking at that price tag and trying to wrap my head around the fact that, you know, do I really want to spend that kind of cash? It's not, I don't have $65,000 just laying around. And in the end, you know, that I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And, you know, I kind of look at it in terms of, here's a comparison. In the States, people buy their dream home and take out a mortgage and spend 30 years paying it off. And nobody bats an eye. That's very common and, and nobody even thinks twice about it a lot of times. And when I moved into my house, I bought a simple little home that I still live in. Um, you know, nothing crazy. It wasn't, it wasn't my dream home. You know, it was just a home and that's all I needed. And so it didn't take me 30 years to pay it off. And so, you know, my dream wasn't a home. My dream was this peak. And, you know, um, it, a, a dream home is more expensive than $65,000. And so, so my dream was actually cheaper than, than, <laughs> you know, other people's dreams. And so, yeah, to get the money, you know, I had did all those fundraisers. And then in the end, I just took out a loan against the house and signed up and, and I went over there and, and did it. And, and I, you know, when it comes to people criticizing me for that, like really at the end of the day, I was the only person that can make that decision. And, um, you know, I made the decision and, and I'm paying my bills. Uh, and so that's that. <laughs> you, you make it sound like the hardest part of climbing Mount Everest was just getting there. It took me three years to put that expedition together, to you know, do the fundraisers, um, get the financial things in order, and then what happened was once I decided to uh, that I was going to go do Everest, 
and, and I was going to, you know, dedicate my life to training for that and prepping for that and the, the nutrition and, and all the training and, and just getting enough sleep um, is, is critical. And so, you know, it was just life consuming and all the sacrifices that I was going to have to make in order to pull this off. But um, once I made that decision to do Everest, then I figured, you know, I might as well do the seven summits because at that point I already had three of them done. So I already had Kilimanjaro done. I already had Denali done and I already had a peak called Aconcagua done and that's the highest peak in South America. So I thought, you know, I've already got three done. If I'm going to do Everest, might as well just finish the seven. So when I made the decision to do Everest, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm all in. Let's, let's finish the seven. And, um, cause Everest would be the hardest one, uh, out of those. And, you know, might as well tick off the other boxes as well. And so, yeah, then I started um, doing these other expeditions and which again, you know, you talked about your climbing resume. And so, oh, you know, as I'm doing all these other peaks, it just adds to your climbing resume. And so yeah. things, you know, they, and they want to know, like, what have you climbed? What yeah. route did you take? Did you summit? Um, did you have any problems with frostbite? Did you have any problems with altitude? They need to know everything. Right. And all um, of a sudden you go from an unknown to a known. Once you tick off Everest, people will start asking you questions, right? Yes. And that's yeah. when they're saying, did you get frostbite? Did you have this? Uh, real quick, I want to finish on uh, Everest before we move on to the rest. Um, there's most like any climb, you have to have like a window, right? Of weather has to be right. When you go, you might be gone for like two to three weeks because you have to acclimate yourself. And then you have to hope that the weather times right. Is there a season of climbing? for Everest yeah, ev like we don't allow Everest anybody in February because it's terrible only in June and the third June and that's it <laughs> uh Everest takes two months yeah and so uh you are definitely looking you know you'll do your rotations and, and so for Everest you do three rotations the third rotation is your summit push and so after you finish your second rotation, now you're going to lo start looking at the forecast. You're going to try and find a weather window with the, the wind speeds are the big thing. You know, you can't be up there you know, when it's too windy. It just is too cold and um, too dangerous and people, you know, it's, it's not safe. And so, yeah, we found a weather window and we, we went for it. There are two climbing seasons for, for Everest pre-monsoon season, which is um, our spring, and then post-monsoon season, which is our fall. And so when you're looking at your weather window, you know, you're kind of projecting it's going to be probably end of May, maybe early June at the latest, but eventually the monsoon season will hit. And so you're kind of trying to like, you know, you, you can't just hang out up there forever waiting for the perfect weather. Um, you might get it, but, you know, eventually you're going to have to, to, to pull the trigger and mm. go because, uh, you know, when the monsoon season hits, you're just never going to get a weather window again. And so um, it is climbable post-monsoon season, but uh, it seems like every year a couple of people will try it in the post-monsoon season, but typically most people will go. Um, pre monsoon season. Okay. It's just better, better yeah. route conditions, more snow. When you finally get to that final day of climbing up at Everest on that third rotation, what's the mindset? It's pretty full on. Um, you know, that, that realization that, um, you know, I'm in the death zone it's bitter cold, so cold, like negative 40, negative 50 type of cold. And um, it seems like, you know, you're, you have a very precarious grip on life at that point. And so there's just no margin for error. And so I'm, I'm putting one foot in front of the other. And, you know, when you're in the death zone, you know, you're kind of dying. And it feels like you're dying and your brain is screaming at you to descend. Like this is not where, 
humans are designed to live at this environment that you're not supposed to be there. And so, um, and I have to override that and continue to press on um, when it's so extremely physically demanding and mentally demanding um, just to keep going. And, you know, you, you're just putting one foot in front of the other. You start in at night, so it's dark and you can't really see a whole lot of the mountain. You know, you, you can just see what little bit your headlight is just illuminating right in front of you where you're putting your feet. Uh, and so you're just pressing on through the night in the bitter cold, in the dark, uh, with very little oxygen. And, you know, it, it's just so unbelievably difficult. And there's you know? how many of you doing this, going through this misery right now? <laughs> A lot. Uh, actually, on the day that I summited, there were probably, mm. I want to say... Uh, I'd have to look at, go back and look at the stats. People keep track of all the stats. And so, so I mean, I'm talking, are we talking 15, 32? We're talking, I think about 200. Okay. So, so yeah, it, it's crowded. It is kind of a, a conga line at that point. Um, and so, you know, you, there's people in front of you and people behind you and you're all just one step at a time all the way up this peak. And it's so hard and, and you're moving you know, you, you take a step and, and you breathe, and breathe, breathe, and breathe, and then take another step. And, and you're like, oh, my God, you know, this is this is such a slow process. And but it's so physically demanding. That's the only speed you can go is is it's one speed and it's slow. And so you're all in this together and you are kind of you just have to press on and you have this mindset, like keep going, you know, stay relaxed, breathe, move your foot, breathe, move your foot uh, again and again and again all night long. And then finally, you know, 430 in the morning, the sun pops up over the horizon. And, and I'm so grateful at that point because I know that things might heat up a little bit. Like I'll get a couple extra degrees of warmth. <laughs> the sun comes up. From negative 40 to negative 38, it's warm. Yes. I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Every degree counts at that point. And so, um, you know, but I can start to see the, the surroundings around me. And for me personally, like things always feel a little bit, um, like I always kind of rejoice in the morning when the sun comes up and I can, things always just seem better when I can actually see them, the peak that I'm walking on. And, and so, um, you know, when we hit the South summit, I knew where I was and I knew that I was only about an hour, hour and a half away from the, the true summit. I can't see the summit yet because it's, you know, that's the cornices on that ridge are blocking my view, but I know I'm close. And so, you know, I just press on and, and it is so physically demanding. And then we hit the summit and, you know, it took about 12 hours. So we left at 9.30 in the evening and, and we hit the summit about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. And just to stand on the summit and, and be there in this space, you know, is surreal and I'm trying to um, just soak up that moment and and that feeling that all the risks I took and all the sacrifices I made, all the hard work that I did and, and the blood, sweat and tears that I really invested, you know, my whole life into this moment um, to stand on that on that peak and be there and and I was successful because there's so many variables and you kind of have to, you know, things you can control, like my health, my fitness level, staying hydrated, making sure I'm covered in sunscreen and making sure that I'm eating enough calories, you know, those things I can control, but there's other things I can't control, like the weather, the route conditions, you know, maybe I get hit by falling ice or falling rock. And so, um, all these things, all these moving puzzle pieces have to come together 
um, in order to be successful. And when they do come together and everything clicks and you make it, you know, it's, it's just a, it's hard to even put it into words, what that feels like. And, and to know that, like I rolled the dice and I was actually, I pulled it off. And, and so then, um, you know, once you stand on the summit though, like you're really only halfway. And so now you need to descend. So there's a little bit of celebration for me at the summit, but it, it's really truly not over. Um, so it took 12 hours to, to summit. And then it took another five hours to descend back to camp four. So in total, it's a 17 hour day. Uh, and you're moving, you're in the death zone the entire time. And so, you know, by the end of the day, I'm pretty wasted. Yeah. And, and you know, just kind of, um, you know, clinging, clinging to life, really. Um, and then I'm only at camp four. Like, I still need to get all the way back down to base camp. And so it's not over yet. And, you know, it takes a couple more days to, to get all the way down. Once you reach base camp, then at that point, you can truly celebrate because at that point, the climbing is over. You made it. You made it. Um, and, and by the time I made it back to Everest base camp, though, I was so wasted. You know, it's so physically and emotionally and mentally demanding. Um, you know, just I was pretty wasted and pretty sick, really, by the time I got back to base camp. But I was successful. And so I, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> And so you, when you say uh, sick, that's an altitude sickness or just Um, a physical body tired sick? um, Yeah, exhaustion, exhaustion to the extreme, Um, you know, just pushing yourself that hard for that long and in an environment where humans really aren't supposed to be, um, I mean, we're not designed to live there. And so... You know, you're you're breathing all this super dry, cold air, and you're breathing so hard. You know, it, it, you kind of freeze drying your lungs, essentially. And and being at that altitude, in that environment where there's just so little oxygen, and so, you know, it's just really taxing on the body. And you know, your your cells are dying as they're not getting enough oxygen. They die, and so I'm kind of pushing myself I'm, there's no way I can eat enough calories to uh, replace all the calories that I just burn and so you kind of you know burning all your are your reserves and and eventually you get to a point where you're just kind of burning muscle and so you, you kind of start to waste away a little bit and it's really hard to eat at altitude and it's really hard to sleep uh, at extreme altitude at least those are symptoms of altitude that's how my body reacts and it's really hard for me to sleep and eat and so um you know all these things combined just it takes a toll and, and you know you just I'm, I'm coughing um because i've been breathing all this super freeze freezing air you know if, if next time we get a, a polar vortex in iowa and you want to know what the the kumbu cost feels like you can go outside and you know, run a mile as fast as you possibly can when it's that cold. And then you start coughing because all that cold air on your lungs is hard on your lungs. And so that's what the, the Kumbu cough is. It's just uh, cold air on, on lungs. And so I'm coughing and I'm kind of just wasted away. So, so skinny, you know, I lost quite a bit of weight. And so, um, you know, it takes a while to, even when I got back to the States, you know, it took, a while to recuperate and you know by the time I got back to Iowa and now it's end of May beginning of June and so you know that we're kind of getting into summer and it's warm and it's humid and I remember stepping off the plane and I'm like oh my god the air is suffocating it's so thick it's so it's so heavy with moisture and so you know it was, it was overwhelming it was like walking into a sauna and so I came home and I think like I cranked my air conditioner down to like 53 and, and still were warm. You were still warm at that time. I was walking around the house in shorts and a t-shirt and it's 53 and people, were, you know, everywhere. I just got home. Everybody wants to come and visit. And, but I'm overwhelmed because 
I've been gone for two months and now I'm trying to get back into my Iowa life. You know, I have, it's almost like I have two different lives. Mm -hmm. I have a climbing life and then I have my Iowa life. And, you know, I'm from here. I've lived in this state my whole life. I know the culture. I know the language. I know the food. But that transition from, from going to one life to the other, you know, they're so different. These lives are, are so different. The, the transition is still really jarring. And so it takes a while for me to kind of um, settle back into this life that I have here. And so, you know, everybody was, was Jen, I want to come over and I talk to you about Everest. And I'm like, ah, like I have, I need groceries. I need to mow the lawn. I have to go back to work. I have a thousand emails I need to read. Um, you know, it, it's so overwhelming. And so people would come over and, and, and they'd walk in and they're like, Jen, it's 53 degrees in your house. What are you doing? And I'm like, it's cold. I'm like, I'm I'm fine. You're cold. And, and I control the thermostat. <laughs> so don't touch my thermostat. Yeah, don't touch my thermostat. It's great <laughs> to give me a thermostat. hug or wave hi, but I'm in charge of the thermostat. All right. What's your day of summit? What do you consider? What was the day that you climbed? Do you remember? May 19th, May 19th of 2016. Uh, yes. What number of person do you believe you were to climb Mount Everest? How many thousands have gone before you? Uh, I they, they keep track of the stats. There's a Himalayan database that keeps track of stats of who climbs everything. And um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head where I am in the, in the total as far as men and women. I know for women, I am the th 399. I'm the, I'm the 399th woman to summit Everest. Um, but that's women from every country. Sure. As far as women from the States, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. That's all right. Um, and then what's the highest altitude they have a picture of you at? Because you can't really just pull out your phone. Do you have a picture from the summit? Oh, yeah, sure. It's Is on that your my... uh, profile picture? I guess I didn't even notice. Yeah, I, I don't have... Um, it's on my Facebook page. I, so if people want to follow me, I'm at Iowa Climber Jen. If they if they go onto Facebook and punch in Iowa Climber Jen, that's kind of where I post um, climbing pictures and and like, hey, I'll be giving a presentation at the library on this day. So they can kind of follow on there. There's a summit picture on that page. Uh, I'm sure of it. Okay. Uh, so you get done with Everest. You try to get back into Iowa life and you had already kind of said, uh, I want to do all seven. It kind of took a little while to complete COVID kind of disrupted, but was yeah. Everest the hardest of, or I'm sorry, was, yeah. Was Everest the hardest of the seven, uh, biggest climbs? Um, I would say for sure Everest in, in Denali is a very close second. And you did Denali uh, the, before you did Everest. So yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, there's some people that I've talked to that consider Denali to be harder than Everest, just because when you're on Everest, you have so much support. You know, there's people cooking for you. There's there's people, you know, doing all these things for you. So that and they do these things for you because it, um, they're, they're kind of when when other people shoulder some of the, the load then it increases your chances of success you know when you have other people doing some of the cooking and all these other things going on but uh, you know that's really only a nepal thing okay. like you know that, that doesn't happen on on other peaks outside of nepal and so when you're on places like denali like you're carrying all your own stuff you're cooking all your own food you're hauling all everything and so um, which is, you know, that's, that's where it's at. It, that's where, you know, you kind of, um, are tested and, and when you're shouldering all your own stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, Denali is, is right up there with that. And then what are the other, uh, you've mentioned three of the seven, what are the other ones that you climbed in order? In order. Okay. So Kilimanjaro first, Aconcagua, Denali, and then um, I did the, there's the peak in Europe, which is called Elbrus. And then um, 
so there's actually two peaks for Australia. And, and because there's kind of a, a little bit of a debate as far as which one counts. So Australia is also not known for having a lot of mountains. <laughs> and so the highest point on Australia is a little peak called Kosciuszko. It's 7,310 feet tall. And so not, uh, it's not really a climb, it's a hike, it's a day hike. And so, but it is the highest point on the mainland of Australia. And so, um, so some people consider that, like that's the peak that you have to do to check Australia off your list. But then there's other people that are like, you know what, it's not really a climb. It's not at altitude, it's, it's, there's no technical, um, you know, nothing technical about it. And so they're like, you know what, this other peak called Carson's Pyramid, that's the one that counts for Australia. It's actually over in Indonesia. It's, it's on the island of Papua New Guinea. Um, and it's at 16,000 feet, a little over 16,000 if I remember right. And it's, it's technical, you're at altitude. And though you're not in Australia, it's on the same tectonic plate. Or some people are like, oh, it's not even on the same tectonic plate. But So there's even a debate about that. But So some people are like, Kosciuszko is the peak for Australia. And other people are like, no, Carson's Pyramid is the peak for Australia. So I did both. That way nobody could... Nobody can argue. Nobody can argue and nobody can dispute it. And nobody can say, oh, you didn't do the seven summits. And so I did both. Um, So that was, let's see, Kilimanjaro, Akakawa, Denali, Elbrus, and the two for um, Australia. So that puts me at six. Um, And then Everest. And then I just did Vinson. And just wrapped it up. And Denson is in Antarctica? Yes. That was the last one I had to do. So I was trying to get there years ago, but I was injured and then COVID hit and shut everything down. So it actually took uh, a couple of years to really um, put this one together. The logistics were a nightmare to try and put it together, to try and travel during COVID and, and all these things. You know, I had to be vaccinated. I had to take COVID tests every day. Um, I had to, you know, you had to get a mobility pass for, for entry into Chile. And so lots of, of extra hoops to jump through. And, and it was, you know, so much extra work and, and a lot of emails and a lot of paperwork. And, and I had to quarantine numerous times in various places while you're waiting for your COVID test results. And then once you got your negative test back, then you could proceed on to your next destination. And so there was tons of extra hoops to jump through. And, and finally, you know, it took a couple of weeks. So Antarctica is really hard to get to, but um, once we got there and we did the climb and, and then, you know, because Antarctica is hard to get to, like it was also hard to get out of. And so I ended up getting stranded there for two extra weeks. <laughs> so I'm just hanging out in Antarctica for quite a while. And just, you know, there's, you're off grid. So, so there's no social media. You can't, I can't scroll on my phone and, and it's hard to touch base with anybody. So I did, I was able to make a phone call using a sat phone so I could, I could call back and say, hey, you know, change my flights and let work know I'm stranded in Antarctica. Two more weeks. And and it was just, well, they kept pushing it out. It was, it was going to be, hey, you're here for a couple more days. And then, hey, you're here for another week. Hey, you're here for a couple more days. And then it ended up being, you know, two full weeks of extra time. But, you know, that kind of, (laughs) it was just, it's, Antarctica is a very special place. It's very beautiful. It's remote. It's pristine. Uh, it's pretty incredible just to be there. Right. All right. So you've done, <clears throat> what's the term for all of these, all seven? The seven summits? Yeah. Is there a term like you're in a certain club now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, no. It, okay. It's just the seven summits. Okay. Uh, so now the last question is what's next? Well, I was just climbing, ice climbing last weekend in Michigan. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing of it is, is, like, this has become a lifestyle for me. You know, I've spent the last 10, 15 years doing nothing but climbing and volunteer work. And, and this is this is my life now. And I'm going to continue 
to do these things because that's what brings me joy and that's you know where my heart is and, and I love it and so yeah I'm and people will, will always ask they're like you know how long are you gonna keep climbing for and I tell them I'm gonna keep climbing unless I can either no longer physically do it or if something happens and it's not fun anymore. So those are the two things that, you know, are, if I can't physically do it anymore, if it's not fun anymore, then it's time to move on to something else. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm going to continue to climb and to do the volunteer work that I do. And, and so these are things that I love and they give meaning to my life. That is awesome on so many fronts, Jen. <laughs> super excited for you, super proud. And uh, you now have the distinction of being the pride of Jessup, Iowa. That's uh, fantastic. Which I would have never guessed. You, you never you would have guessed from Spring Creek <laughs> to the top of Mount guessed. Everest. It all goes uh, together. Uh, yeah, I would have never guessed. Uh, and you know, Jen, are you still, before we wrap up here, are you still, can people contribute to your efforts? Sure. I mean, um, I have a book now and, and that kind of helps support me. You know, it's on my website. I put together a book of, uh, of photographs and journal excerpts. Um, I found that when I get home from an expedition, people want two things from me. They want to see pictures and they want to hear stories. And so, and people have been pressing me for years. They're like, Jen, you know, write a book, write a book, write a book. And I never had the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And then when COVID hit, you know, now I, I'm home and I'm, I'm, there's not much going on. So I have time to like put a book together. And, and I went back and, and I, you know, I'd never gone back and re read my journals and I had never really gone back and looked at the photographs because I was always, moving on to the next thing. So, you know, this forced me to just chill for a while. So I actually went back and looked at the photographs and, and read the journal excerpts or read the journals. And, and so I put this book together of photographs and journal excerpts from, from my travels. And it was kind of a wild ride just to go back and read all this stuff. That's awesome. And, yeah. and look at my own trajectory through, through all the expeditions. And, and so, um, I have the, it's a coffee table book. Of, and so that's available on my website, which is also iwaclimbergen.com. And um, yeah, I've had people just like um, Venmo me, <laughs> which <laughs> I don't know. It's it, This is Iowa nice. Kind yeah. Of true. You know, it really is. Um, and just, you know, people, total strangers send me checks and I'm like, this is Iowa nice. Like this is, this is one of the things like people always ask me, Jen, why do you stay in Iowa? Like there's no mountains here. And, and I stay here because this is home. I've lived my entire life here. My family is here. My friends are here. And, and the Iowa nice that comes through, you know, that's, that's something that is pretty special. And so, you know, I love it here and it's beautiful here. Iowa gets a bad rap as as not being a beautiful state oh it's a flyover state well the reality is like it's really beautiful here and i actually put a whole chapter of, of photographs from iowa that i took here in iowa in the book because i wanted people to see like this is why i love this state because we have iowa nice and it's beautiful and so, so that was important to me to add that to the book. So it's not just all climbing pictures. It's all about perspective, isn't it? It really is. It is. All right. Like you have to get, like if all you do is drive down 80 and see cornfields, and then that's all you're going to see. You have to get off the interstate. There you go. Get off the interstate. Get back into the neighborhood here to the home <laughs> place right there. Jen Lowe, thank Spring you Creek. so very much for the time. Congratulations. Awesome uh, experience and great to hear all these stories. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Bob. It's good to talk to you. If you missed part one, go back, watch it or listen. Then you can hear and enjoy part two. So hopefully you took them both in. 
Thank you to Jen for your time. Good luck to you on the next chapter. I'm very curious to see how you top that, but I'm sure she'll come up with something. If you have any feedback for me, paul.yeager at iowapbs is my email, or market to market at iowapbs are the two emails. We'll see you next time on this installment of the MTOM Show podcast. Thank you, and we'll talk to you next time.